The Ninth Invocation Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Having invoked each of the three divine persons separately, we address all three jointly and beg for mercy. When we say Holy Trinity, we confess our belief in the threefold personality of God, and by adding one God, we express the unity of God. For there are three persons in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Each of these three persons is really and truly God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. They are not three gods, but three persons in one God, because all three persons have only one divine nature. Unity in Trinity, Trinity in Unity. How marvelous! Unity in Trinity, Trinity in Unity. Unity of nature in trinity of persons. Trinity of persons in unity of nature. What admirable concord, what rapturous harmony. They are not three gods, because each of them has not a particular godhead, but each is, nevertheless, God, because each participates in the godhead common to all three persons, and possesses it perfectly whole and entire. The three divine persons differ from one another in their manner of being. Each one has his being in a different and to him peculiar manner. The Father is from eternity and of himself. The Son is not of himself, but proceeds from the Father, begotten of him from all eternity. In like manner, the Holy Ghost is not of himself, neither is he begotten, but from all eternity proceeds both from the Father and the Son. This great mystery of the Blessed Trinity was only obscurely indicated in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ first revealed it in clear and distinct terms when he said, Going, baptize all nations in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He did not say, In the names, but in the name teaching thereby the unity of God, and by saying in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He taught that they are three persons in one God, or one God in three divine persons, the Trinity. My dear Christian, you cannot comprehend the mystery of the Blessed Trinity, though you should possess the combined knowledge of all the most learned on earth, and understanding of the angels in heaven. For your faith you have a foundation as firm as a rock, the infallible word of God which the church announces to you. Believe, pray, and often say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Live in such a manner that you may hope hereafter to see the holy triune God, not as now, through a glass in an obscure manner, but face to face. Thus to see the ever and adorable Trinity will be to you an inexhaustible source of ineffable bliss. Although the mystery of the blessed Trinity is incomprehensible, the benefits which flow to us from it are manifest. God the Father is the creator of heaven and earth. Whatever lives, exists, and moves in this vast universe, he called into being out of nothing. He it is that preserves and governs the whole world, and without his will or permission, nothing whether great or insignificant can be done. He thinks of all. Not a sparrow falls from the roof without his knowledge and will. Even the hairs on our head are numbered. His solicitude extends to the little insect, whose shining wings glitter in the sunlight in the dust, as well as to the cherub that sits before his glorious throne. The eyes of all hope in him, and he gives them meat in due season. He opens his hand and fills with blessing every living creature. God the Son is our Redeemer. In his infinite love he came from heaven upon earth and became man in order to accomplish the work of our redemption. 
And how has he accomplished this work? He became a poor, weak, helpless child, lived in poverty and lowliness on earth for 33 years, endured persecutions and sufferings of every description, and finally died in the most intense ignominy and pain on the cross. Thus the Son of God redeemed us from sin and eternal damnation, reconciled us with God the Father, and again opened for us the portals of heaven. The Holy Ghost is our sanctifier. Jesus Christ, having accomplished the work of our redemption, the Holy Ghost incessantly labors to apply to us the fruits of redemption and to effect our sanctification. He enlightens us that we may know what is good and true. He gives us the will and the strength to walk in the way of God's commandments. He cleanses us from the stains of sin and infuses into our hearts the love of God. Yea, he dwells in us himself and bestows upon us graces innumerable that we may fight the good fight and obtain the crown of glory. The Holy Ghost is like a mother who loves her child most tenderly, watches over it as the apple of her eye, and with the greatest solicitude supplies all its wants. Consider these benefits of the Blessed Trinity and reciprocate them with the gratitude befitting their value. Be a good, obedient child of your Father in heaven. Place entire confidence in him and love with him with your whole heart. Walk in the footsteps of your Redeemer. Deny yourself, mortify your passions, and live according to the principles of the gospel. Be docile. Cheerfully follow the inspirations of the Holy Ghost and preserve a pure heart that he may always dwell in you. We may address this petition for mercy to the Blessed Trinity with the greatest confidence, for we are the children of the Father who loves us most tenderly, brothers and sisters of the Son who for love of us became man, suffered and died, temples of the Holy Ghost who dwells within our souls. But alas, we have often and grievously sinned against the Blessed Trinity, against the Father by our sins of ignorance, against the Son by our sins of weakness, and against the Holy Ghost by our sins of malice. We have every reason, therefore, to fear that the Blessed Trinity may reject us and not have mercy on us. But there is one, there is one in whom the Blessed Trinity is well pleased, Mary, the Holy Virgin, for she is the dearly beloved daughter of the Father, the chosen mother of the Son, and the Immaculate Spouse of the Holy Ghost. She, therefore, can obtain from the Blessed Trinity whatever she may ask in our behalf. The following remarkable occurrence took place in Rome during the pontificate of Pope Gregory, the great pontiff and glorious saint. The pestilence broke out. Every day the disease carried off a vast number of persons of both sexes and of all ages and conditions. In vain had the Holy Father preached penance, ordered fasting, and enjoined public prayers. At length he had recourse entirely to Mary, whose image, painted by St. Luke, he was inspired to carry in procession through the streets of Rome. O oh, prodigy! Scarcely had the august likeness of Christ's dear mother been brought forth from its sanctuary than the plague suddenly ceased its ravages, so suddenly as to leave no doubt of such a miracle. At the same moment there was seen over Adrian's terrace, since called the castle of San Angelo, an angel in human form sheathing a bloody sword and celestial spirits were heard singing that hymn of joyful gratitude in honor of Mary, Regine Celi Laetari Alleluia, to which the sovereign pontiff and the entire procession added in strains of joy, Ora pro nobis Deum Alleluia. The church subsequently adopted that hymn to salute the Queen of Heaven during the Paschal season, which is the time of our beloved mother's joys. My dear Christian, 
In this example you again perceive the power of Mary's intercession. We see how a terrible pestilence which spared neither age nor youth and fastened its fell grasp on the wealthy alike as upon those suffering from poverty and want was arrested by prayers and supplications to her. Equally efficacious, nay more so, is her intercession with Jesus for the poor sinner stricken down with the epidemic of sin. You have sinned, whether grievously or not, is best known to your own soul. Ask her to aid you in your efforts to lead a holy life.